It is the Banner Baseball Show. Paul Mancano and Andy Casca. I'm back up here in cold Baltimore. Andy is down there in warm Sarasota. And a rare off day for you, Andy, after the night game last night. How are you spending your off day? Us editing articles, writing more articles, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully see the sun at one point today. So not really an off day for you. Maybe for the team, but not for you. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so we got a lot to talk about here today. We're a couple weeks now into Grapefruit League action. Of course, still uh, plenty of time left before opening day and before the team breaks for Baltimore. But Andy, the competition, especially in the outfield, has not gotten any easier. There are three guys vying for one, maybe two spots. Uh, but it's it's going to be it's going to be close. I mean, between Kyle Stowers, Colton Kowser, and Heston Kerstad. Nothing has gotten any easier for Michael Elias or Brandon Hyde. Yeah, it's I do I do not envy their position at all. Uh, well, I guess in some ways most executives would envy their position because they have a a surplus of options. But trying to decide between all of these guys, I mean, Stowers has batted terrifically this this spring, and I think he kind of entered as uh, an outsider. Uh, you know, had fourteen games, uh, didn't perform at a high level. During those 14 games, a tiny sample size last year, uh, you know, then had some injury issues that, you know, in, in, in AAA last year, you know, one of them, you know, was fractured nose is, is nothing he can do besides just, uh, you know, super unlucky um, with, with that. But he, he's, I think, in the last seven days alone, four home runs uh, for him or two home runs, four hits. Something along those lines, you know, where it's just, you know, it's, it's been, been pretty much on fire um, and he. Uh, has played him played his way into a a look at this opening day roster. Uh, same with Colton Kowser has has just been really terrific so far this spring. Uh, a couple of strikeouts, you know, have have ticked up uh, in the last couple of days, but um, just the overall at bats have looked really good, especially left on left for both Kyle Stowers and Colton Kowser. Uh, Heston Kerstad, of course, you know. Defensively, it has, has looked good in the outfield, which was maybe the biggest question mark. You know, his bat is going to play. Um, hasn't batted at the highest level compared to the other two, but um, you do know what Heston could do with the plate, and this is early spring training, so not the biggest concern. Um, you know, I, I've, I've seen him left on left sliders, uh, have given him some issues, uh, which is something to, to watch out for, but um, all three of those guys are incredibly difficult. And uh, who makes the team? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I would say just my my early front runner would be Colton Kowser because he can play center field um, as well as left and right field. But yeah. the, with the way he's batting and the fact that he can play center field, uh, com, you know, the other two, uh, Stowers can play a little bit, you know, played a little bit in the minors, played a little bit at Stanford, uh, but not as regularly as as Colton Kowser uh, has in his, in his career. And even the spring, Kowser's played it. Uh, you know, pretty, you know, pretty often. Um, but that's the that's the one knock on uh, on those two is that. <coughs> ah, excuse that's me, that was great. Now we needed a sneeze button on that me. one. Yeah, but that's the one knock on uh, on uh, blame the pollen down here, man. You should see it. It's oh uh, my gosh, Florida, it cakes Florida's everything. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like the the entire rental car is uh, it's a black <laughs> car that's painted painted yellow. Uh, yeah, so that's a that's an aside, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, Stowers and Kerstad are not probably going to play much center field. Uh, definitely not center field for for Kerstad. Um, yeah, and uh, so that is uh, that, that's you know and kind of a a detriment in, in their versatility. Um, of course, Kerstad could play a little bit of first base in the future. Definitely DH. So there's there's you know flexibility. But I think Cowers or Colton Cowser would be the front runner at this point. So the question, though, is with with center field, you know, you have Cedric Mullins there, obviously, who's also hits from the left side of the plate. Austin Hayes can play center and he's a righty. Then you've got Ryan McKenna, who is a righty who can play all three defensive positions in the outfield, was used in center a lot when uh, Cedric Mullins went down last year, when Brandon Hyde wanted a righty option in center field. Ryan McKenna's out of options. Would you have any consideration towards you know, leaving Ryan McKenna off this roster in favor of, you know, another one, in addition to Colton Kowser, maybe adding Kowser and Kerstad, maybe adding Kowser and Stowers 
and letting go of a, a talented speedster and defensive uh, wizard in Ryan McKenna. Yeah, it's a huge, huge call for the Orioles to make. I, I would, I would kind of consider um, McKenna as an outsider just because he doesn't have the roster flexibility. I mean, if Colton, if Colton comes to the team and he struggles for a little bit, you can option him. He has right. has an option, you know, has two options. So, you know, has the flexibility that that you can you can maneuver your outfield a little bit. Uh, in this case. With McKenna, you know, if he comes up and you and you need to make a change, if you're facing a bunch of right-handed hit, you know, right-handed pitchers, and you're like, hey, we want to, you know, move a right-handed uh, Ryan McKenna to the minors, bring up a Heston Kerstad, so we, you know, Heston uh, can play more against the slew of right-handers that are coming up this series. Uh, you just don't have the flexibility with that, and that's a really difficult thing. Um, McKenna, that, that would be a, that'd be a hard decision for the Orioles to make because of all Ryan has done. Uh, since 2021 as this fourth outfielder. Um, plus, you you like the fact that McKenna has proven, number one, capable of being a fourth outfielder and not getting every day at bats. Uh, you know, he's, he's able to come in off the bench and be a defensive replacement. Um, doesn't need to play every day uh, to to be an impact player. Um, that's, that's a valuable thing. And I, I think there is a, a certain aspect of this where, you know, with any of these three guys we have, you know, on the bottom, on this, on this bottom line right here, Kowser, Stowers, or Kerstad, you probably want them having every day at bats. And yeah. if you are the fourth outfielder, um, probably mixing time with maybe Kowser can play a lot of right field. Uh, and, and, and Santander is more of a DH this year. Maybe that's the way they go, but you kind of want them in the lineup five times a week. And it right. would, it would be a bigger challenge um, doing that with three everyday outfielders and, and Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, and, and uh anthony sots on dare that that's that's probably the advantage for a guy like ryan mckenna and you know even like a daniel johnson you know who you, you got on a minor league deal um those guys you ne don't necessarily have to give at bats as frequently um and they can be kind of defensive replacements right so and I, it's, yeah it's, it depends on what they want and I, it's the same kind of conversation that uh i know a lot of fans see Kobe Mayo mashing down in Sarasota and they think, could he potentially replace Ramon Arias? They're both right-handed. They both can play third base. The, the issue there is Michael Elias doesn't like to ever let talent walk out the door without getting something in return. And it would require probably a trade to get Ramon Arias out because Michael Elias wouldn't want to let a positive war player like Ramon Arias just head to waivers and be claimed by another team. He would probably want to get something for Ramon Rios. In the same vein, I think he would try to get something for Ryan McKenna. I don't think McKenna has the same kind of value that Ramon Rios or maybe even Jorge Mateo would have. But, you know, it's tough to just let these veterans go without getting anything in return because Michael Elias needs to win on the margins in order to keep this team competitive. Correct, yeah. And, and yeah, I really do not see them letting anyone walk, uh, you know, the guys that have been positive major leaguers, you know, for many years at this point, uh, they're probably not going to, you know, the O's are probably not going to let them just walk without getting something in return. Um, Ramon Arias too, you know, defensive versatility. You can play first base, a little bit of shortstop, definitely a second base and third. Um, that's a big advantage. Uh, Kobe Mayo has a gigantic future ahead of him. He's going to be a terrific big leaguer. Um, we, we saw last night, you know, in, in the in the spring training game. Uh, I guess other people didn't see. It wasn't on TV, so most people didn't see. But, um, you know, he made a great charging play at third base where he makes a quick transition, um, shows shows his athleticism, uh, makes a good throw to first uh, for an out. That's the kind of thing that you look at that and you say, wow, if his glove can be average at worst and potentially plus, then you have this terrific bat in the lineup that Kobe Mayo can be a, a huge factor for the team. But then you also consider where do you get everyday at bats for Kobe Mayo right now? Um, Jackson Holiday, let's pencil him in at, at second base. You're going to want him playing almost every day. Uh, Gunnar Henderson, shortstop. Jordan Westberg, third base. You know, does Kobe Mayo split time at third base with Jordan Westberg and Jordan, you know, splits time at second base with Jackson holiday. You know, right. it, it's just so many questions. You, you don't want Gunnar Henderson out of the lineup ever. 
between third and shortstop. So no. it is a, you know, and Mike, Mike Elias has said many times in the past how he does not like the idea of having a prospect uh, not having everyday development in games right. at the major league level when they could be, you know, if they're going to be a fringe major league guy, but they could be, you know, an everyday star and really develop at the AAA level, probably going to have the AAA level be where he's at. Where he's at. So expect Kobe Mayo at some at some point this season. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it might not be an opening day. Kobe Mayo hitting 333 this spring. He has yet to homer, but he's got five RBIs. He's walked four times and he's hit four doubles in 10 games. He's just 22 years old. So I think the, the biggest thing there is that there's less urgency when it comes to Kobe Mayo than there might be for Kowser, Kerstad, or Stowers, because those guys are a little bit older, 24, 25. You know, they they have a little bit more seasoning at the AAA level, and all three of those guys have already come to the major league level with varying degrees of success. I think the interesting thing with those three guys is whether Stowers has really, truly earned his way back into this conversation, because like you said, him getting hit in the face with a pitch last year that is just an unfortunate, unlucky injury that he underwent last year. And that really set his timetable back. And it just so happened to coincide with Colton Kowser hitting the crap out of the ball in AAA and Heston Kerstad hitting very well and getting called up to the big leagues and doing well in the final month of the season. So he just kind of got Wally pipped and got replaced, you know, surpassed by these two guys. But we forget that in 2022, we were talking about Kyle Stowers being maybe a future big league piece on this team in a corner outfield. So whether Kyle Stowers has done anything to, to get himself back in, you tweeted at AF Costco, by the way, uh, the other day that keep in mind, the front office is looking more for process and they're looking for approach than they are looking at results. You know, they're not going to just take the guy who has the best batting average or has the highest OPS at the end of spring. We saw what happened last year with Franchi Cordero, who, hit the cover off the ball in spring training, didn't matter. He didn't make the team. So where does Kyle Stowers' strong spring fit into this conversation? And are they just as impressed with his approach and his process as they are with the results that they've seen? Yeah, they, they are very impressed with the, you know, approach and process. And I talked to Cody Ashey, um, who's an offensive strategy coach, uh, which is just a, another title. He's just another hitting coach. Uh, but <laughs> But um, he was, you know, really emphasizing how uh, Kyle Stowers has simplified his approach, um, less thinking in the box, more, um, you know, quick to the ball, uh, less movement at the plate. Um, just simplified is is the word that kept coming out of both their mouths. Um, we, we've seen the results so far from it are, are great. And I think it's, it is, you know, you had great context there. I mean, in 2022, you know, when, when Kyle Stowers comes up, you know, it seems like he is the the prospect who will be the most obvious breakthrough guy. Had a yeah. really good 2022. Uh, you thought he could he could stick. 2023, it just it it didn't it didn't happen because of you know the two two injuries, one of which was just you know the most unlucky thing you could have, um, and. You, you do figure like this spring can, you know, the, the spring is, is a huge spring for him. And he knows it because number one, he's showing that the process is really good with the simplified approach. And he's also showing that the results are really good with the simplified approach. So uh, I do think he has kind of elevated his way back into this conversation, uh, into a big part of this conversation. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see what, what happens on, you know, two weeks from now, three weeks from now when, uh, you know, the Orioles are deciding a opening day roster, but I still expect Kyle Stowers to be a big part of this team. And, you know, maybe he's a, maybe he's a trade piece uh, and he's a big part of another team, but he, he will be a major leaguer. And he's showing this spring that he deserves to be in the conversation just as highly as, as Kowser and Kerstad. Absolutely. You mentioned him earlier, but Jackson holiday, you had him penciled in, in your opening day lineup, just 20 years old. He is off to a great start this spring. He's hitting 333. He has no homers, but he's got four extra base hits, two doubles, two triples. He's got a, a walk, a stolen base in his first seven games. He's gotten a lot of look at second base. You know, he can play shortstop, and he's gotten some time over there as well so far this spring. 
is he still have the inside track for uh, an opening day roster spot? And if so, do you see him as the Orioles second baseman to start the season? I do. I, I, I still think uh, he does. You know, there, there's 20. part of me that he's 20. Yeah, no, he's 20. But uh, I just think the, the Orioles are at a stage right now where if a player is going to help them win, he's on the roster. And I, I think we've seen, you know, not just, again, like the results only mean so much in spring as a small sample size, but just the way that Jackson Holiday has been able to rapidly alter his approach, alter his, um, you know, like, for example, he struck out twice Sunday, felt like he got beaten by the fastball. Um, Monday, he went into the cage had this really competitive batting practice, mixed batting practice, they call where, where the coach is throwing all sorts of pitches, throwing them really hard, trying his darndest to, to get a guy out. And Jackson felt like that got his timing back. And throughout his entire life, you know, he has been very quick at knowing what he needs and getting his timing back. And then Tuesday he comes out uh, against the Phillies, Zach Wheeler, and hits a double his first at bat. And then he goes on and, and hits a triple. That might that probably should have been caught, honestly. But you know, yeah. hits a triple, uh, and then hits a hits a single, you know, in his third at bat, and just you look at that, and you're just like, wow, like this is this is two two days earlier, he struck out twice and looked at looked like a twenty year old playing and playing at you know major league spring training, uh, and now he looks like, you know, he is deserving of a major league roster spot. I think those are the things that maybe more so than than the results or just the fact that he was able to turn the page so quickly as a 20 year old know exactly what he needed to work on and was able to implement it immediately. That is the, that is the biggest promising uh, thing about Jackson holiday. Uh, this head on the shoulders that he does not seem to be, he is unfazed by the stage. Uh, he grew up on this stage. You know, he, he, he knows, he knows what he's doing. So I still think, um, I still think he's on the opening day roster, but you know, if you ask Daniel Allen Tuck, our, our, our you know my co beat writer and and uh, colleague, our colleague at the Baltimore Banner, uh, I think she would be a little bit more hesitant and say, you know, he has only had twenty six or whatever AAA at bats, and she's very correct. Uh, not at bats, sorry, twenty six games or so yes, in yeah. AAA um, or thereabout. Small sample size in AAA. Um, it didn't maybe, hit all that well. It when didn't. He yeah, comparatively, all that still, at least. yeah, all yeah. that well was still like 267, like okay. right, <laughs> uh, yeah, for a 19 year old at the time. Um, yeah. but you know, so there, there's there's two arguments to be made, yeah, he hasn't had all that much AAA experience, and and maybe he could further develop there, but at the same time, he's proving in the moment that it can develop against major league players, and and if he gets beaten one day, he can come back the next day and be better. Right. And 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 know what to and know what to do with the plate and say I'm not going to get beaten on the fastball. I mean, yeah. Matt Borgschalti, one of the co-hitting coach uh, for the O's. You know, I was standing right behind the the uh, the turtle. You know, for batting practice, and Matt tells uh, Jackson on Tuesday, "Hey, don't miss the fastball. That first pitch, that first pitch fastball, you're going to hit the heck out of it." And that first pitch fastball from Zach Wheeler came, and Jackson did not swing. Because it was a ball. It was a great take. <laughs> but, like, he was ready. And Jackson said after the game, he was like, yeah, I was so ready for that first pitch fastball. And he was on it, and then he hit a cutter, you know, which, you know, he hit, you know, 104 miles per hour. Yeah. You know, it was, it was phenomenal. <laughs> but, like, it was such a good at bat, the way that, you know, he he was ready for that first pitch, first pitch fastball because he knows that, hey, that might be the best pitch I'm getting all, you know, this entire plate appearance. He's, he's, on, he's on time for it. Yeah. And then he was able to adjust off the fastball like the best players in baseball do. And took a curveball just below the zone on a two a two strike curveball that he that he took, that was a great take. And I think more, you know, we we've seen guys swing through those, and we've seen Jackson Holiday swing through those, and he will swing through those many times in his career. But just the fact that you know here he is against one of the most consistent pitchers in baseball, a starting pitcher, as a twenty year old, and he's able to, you know, adjust off of the fastball and a two strike count and take that curveball and then. You know, foul off the next pitch in the sixth pitch. He drives into a right center gap. So impressive. I mean, it was, 
beyond his years. I mean, I would be raving about that at bat if, you know, if that was Anthony Santander who had that at bat, you know, a seasoned veteran who is, you know, proven major league hitter, you know, I'd still be raving about that at bat because it was, yeah. it was, it was really well done against one of the best pitchers in baseball. So, uh, and the fact that he's nine years younger than Anthony Santander. <laughs> That's crazy to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that that is it's one thing for him to, you know, at the beginning of spring training, we were raving about him coming into the clubhouse and immediately showing that he was, you know, one of the big leaguers in the way that he carried himself. It's one thing to do that. And then it's another thing to go out there and actually perform like one of the big leaguers like he has this spring. And he's made himself you know, right in the center of that conversation, at least to make the opening day roster. You wrote about on the Baltimore banner.com recently, Jorge Mateo, who is trying to turn himself into a true super utility player for the Orioles right now, spent pretty much the entire off season, five days a week. He said, working on his center field abilities. We saw him last year, get some time in center. That might change the outfield conversation. We talk about Stowers, you know, Kowser, Kerstad, which of those three might make it. You have Jorge Mateo as a legitimate center field option, as a speedster. We know that he already was had the inside track at making this team regardless because of his defensive abilities at shortstop and because of his abilities as a pinch runner. But if he can actually play center field, do you think that uh, that changes the equation for what the Orioles might be looking at in terms of the roster construction and whether Jorge Mateo is changing that calculus? Yeah, I, I do, because let's think here. If Jorge Mateo can play a good center field, um, which we, we've seen him at his best, we've seen him at his worst, <laughs> you know, uh, in center field, that is, you know, with one game last year, six out against, uh, maybe it was the Astros. Um, yeah, I think it was, where, you know, misses a catch near the wall, but also robs a home run a little bit earlier. In the game. Right. So, you know, he has the ability to rob a home run, but just needs a little bit more extra repetitions to, to understand the dimensions of a ballpark and stuff. And that, that's part of the learning curve. And, you know, it's pretty understandable for a, a young center fielder to have those issues. But think for a second. I mean, if, if Jorge Mateo can play a good center field, you have Cedric Mullins, Jorge Mateo, Austin Hayes, Colton Kowser, if Colton Kowser makes the team. Those are four yeah. center fielders you have. That probably means Ron McKenna is not as necessary as a defensive yeah. replacement because you can rely on Jorge Mateo as a defensive replacement, which then opens up a roster spot. You feel way more comfortable having Heston curse that or Kyle Stowers because you can run with five outfielders, even if one of those outfielders, even if two of those outfielders really can't play center field, Santander and, and, and Heston or, you know, uh, Stowers, whichever one, you know, it is uh, because you have a confidence in, in Mateo being able to fill in in that position if you need him to. Uh, plus, he's a right-handed bat. Um, a lot of those guys are, you know, a huge boost for McKenna is that he's a right-handed hitter and Mullins, Sonata is a switch hitter, but um, Mullins, uh, Kowser, uh, Stowers, and and Kerstad are all left lefties. Um, right. So if, if they stack, you know, if an opposing team stacks a bunch of left-handed pitching like the Texas Rangers did yeah. um, and you don't feel comfortable, obviously – Stowers and, and Kowser have looked great against left-handed pitching. So it, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, you don't have to necessarily go with a right-handed right -handed hitter. But the fact that Mateo could play as a, uh, you know, as a right-handed hitter, it uh, really just depends on if he can be a, if he can be a productive, um, if he can be a productive hitter. Uh, we saw in, in April, May last year was, was so good. Um, this spring has, has looked pretty good. Two home runs. Um, in one game earlier this week, uh, a single last night. Uh, I think it was a single. Yeah, it was a single. Um, so he, he looks, he looks, you know, good at the plate. Uh, played winter ball. Uh, feels like his swing is in a good place because he played winter ball. Mm -hmm. uh, but can he have longevity? And I think there's no way that Jorge Mateo is not on this roster. Um, right. He's way too valuable not to have him on the roster. Be it pinch running, you know, second base. He played some second base last night. Uh, which was we haven't seen him do frequently, but think about the super utility role. Shortstop is his main position, and if he, you know he has plays a good second base too, uh, plays a good center field or left field because of the huge Camden Yards left field. Uh, he's on the roster, you know, in yeah. my opinion, 100. Um, percent But I, I do think you it, it does change the calculus of what the outfield competition looks like, and you probably feel a lot more comfortable having Heston Kerstad and, and Colton Kowser 
um, both on the roster because you don't necessarily feel like, oh, we don't have a true really good center field backup because you have Hayes and you have um, you have Mateo who could play in center and Kowser as well, obviously can play center. Uh, just right. maybe not as not as experienced at it. I, you probably feel better with him in left or, or right, but I still think he can play a pretty good center field. Um, yeah, so many options, so many options. You could right. We could we could sit down and it's almost like a March Madness bracket. Like yeah. we, could, we could put out like 14 million different roster combinations and maybe yeah. not get it right. Right. Like all of those. Like I think it's like a March Madness bracket. It's pretty yeah. crazy. It, it is insane. The the combinations. And just think three weeks from today is opening day. That's three weeks. That Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde have to make all these decisions. I do want to get your thoughts on the pitching side real quick, because we figured when. We found out John Means was a month behind when we found out Kyle Bradish is, you know, slower than usual because of his UCL sprain. We figured, all right, Tyler Wells, Cole Irvin, those are going to be your four or five in this rotation, at least until those two guys come back. And then the Orioles went and added Julio Tehran a couple weeks ago to on a minor league deal that had an invite to spring training. And it's three games. It's it's th or three innings, I should say. Two, yeah, two games, three innings. Two games, three innings, has yet to allow a hit, has yet to allow an earned run. And he's looked good. You know, he's walked one. He's struck out one. He's 33 years old. The Orioles clearly saw something that they liked in him by bringing him in. Is there any room for Julio Tehran to make this team? He doesn't have a whole lot of experience in his career coming out of the bullpen. But does he have room? Is there room in this bullpen for Julio Tehran? Is there room in this rotation for Julio Tehran? Yeah, I'm on the Julio Tehran hype train. Uh, you know, <laughs> don't I've, fall I've, in love with spring training, guys. That's the hardest <laughs> thing. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm firmly aboard the hype train. Uh, I'm also on the Albert Suarez hype train. Yeah, uh, look very. We'll, good. we'll get, we'll get to Albert Suarez in a second. But Julio Tehran, I think there's, there's absolutely a place in this, on this team. And you know, he has an opt out in his contract, so if he doesn't make the opening day roster. You know, he can choose to be a free agent, but he could also accept a retention bonus of a hundred thousand to go to the minor leagues, which uh is a possibility. I mean, I'm not I don't I don't know, obviously it's it's still an open competition, but that's a possibility, and you'd love having him in the minor leagues for depth uh, if that if that was the case. But uh let's say that well, I will say I think Tyler Wells and, and Cole Irvin are the four or five starters. I think that's pretty much locked in. The starting rotation is pretty much set unless something crazy happens. Right. Um, but Toronto, I think, can be like that sixth guy. Um, say that you know you need a long guy right after uh, you know Tyler Wells pitches, and you're you know for some reason he goes four innings. All right, throw in Tehran for two. You know, I think that's a perfect situation for him to be that swingman. Um, it's such a popular role this you, you know in, in modern baseball. Look at the Tampa Bay Rays; they have like you know entire roster of swing guys. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I, I do think there is space for him. He did it a handful of times for the Milwaukee Brewers last year, Tehran. Um, uh, I think maybe three like times, I believe three times. Yeah. Three yeah. times. So like not very frequently, but right. you know, I asked, I asked him about it and he said, he's totally open to it. He liked it last year. He really just wants to make the team. He wants to play major league baseball. Um, it's very, uh, you know, he's very, uh, focused on, on, on doing his best to get back there. Uh, so I do think there is space for him. It's kind of a competition right now between, you know, I have like probably Bruce Zimmerman is in that um, in that realm as well as like could be a long guy out of the bullpen. Um, and, and and Bruce looked good last night for his first two innings, had four strikeouts and two innings. And then as the rain fell in Sarasota, um, you know, lost a little bit of command and uh, gave up a couple of runs in, the, in his third inning of work, which was unfortunate for him. But uh, still has looked pretty good this camp and, and has been throwing the ball a lot better since uh, recovering from offseason uh, abdomen surgery, uh, which he pitched he pitched through an injury for a lot of 2023, which was a, you know obviously a difficult thing for him to do. So th there's a couple guys that are you know in that long man role. You could have Keegan Aiken, who has looked great this spring, uh, four strikeouts and three hitless innings. I think it is um, pretty sure. Uh, yeah, so there's a number of guys, but I do think that Julio Tehran is is if I had to make my opening day roster, he's on it because um, I think he he brings such tremendous flexibility. Um, he doesn't miss a lot of bats, um, but you don't need to because he has 
like he's a ground ball pitcher, um, you know, and yeah. there's a great, there's a great infield defense. And I think he can really strive, uh, thrive rather. Um, he can thrive in Baltimore with this phenomenal infield defense. And if he just gets a lot of ground balls, it's going to be a great thing. Yeah. Uh, for his career, averaging 7.7 strikeouts per nine, but those numbers have been pretty down in the last couple seasons, just 6.3 Ks per nine uh, last year. So yeah, not, yeah. I mean, not... you got to think, yeah. I mean, when he was with the Braves early in his career, he was a fireballer, you know, yeah. he was striking out guys all the time, but the velocity has dropped in, in, in recent seasons. He's uh, changed his, uh, he's changed his uh, arsenal. Some mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I wish I remembered off the top of my head exactly what I did um, to change the arsenal. I think I tweeted about it at one point. So if people want to look it up. Um, at AF Costco. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> they, can, they can look it up. I tweeted about it at one point, but it's out of my brain. Uh, but yeah, he altered his, you know, to add some more off-speed pitches. I think, uh, you know, the splitter in there. Everyone loves the splitter now. Uh, it's the most popular pitch in the O's clubhouse uh, to add a splitter. Uh, Mike Bauman added a splitter, uh, by the way. He looked great with the, with the splitter. But... Um, yeah, I think Tehran is a, a shrewd pickup by Michael Eyes, and he could be a, a major impact guy for a month or longer. You don't know. Yeah. I mean, you need you need so many different pitchers in a yes. season. And sometimes all you need is three good weeks from a guy. Yeah. And if you can get three good weeks and that's all they do their entire season, and they're, then they're either off the roster or in AAA, I mean, that's a huge benefit for our team to have a guy for that little amount of time. Yeah, I mean, how how often did we see last year the Orioles benefit from guys, especially in the bullpen, coming up for a stretch? You know, Jacob Webb, I think of as somebody who was added very late in the season and came in and filled in great in the you know final couple months of the season. Guys like that that can just give you a you know a spark out of the bullpen for a little bit. A couple guys that I want to get your thoughts on real quick that are probably viewed more right now still as starting pitchers. Cade Povich, Chase McDermott, let's throw Seth Johnson into that conversation, even though Seth Johnson doesn't have quite the same amount of experience as Povich and McDermott. But two guys in Povich and McDermott that have turned some heads, I think you could say, this spring. Very good spring training. Uh, you know, when the Orioles acquired these guys, in addition to Seth Johnson at the 2022 trade deadline, they were looking at maybe some starting pitchers of the future. Have you liked what you've seen from them? And, you know, even though you just said, and I agree that that the starting five is set in the, this rotation to start the year, you potentially have means coming back soon. You potentially have Kyle Bradish coming back soon, but maybe if you're looking down the road, Povich and McDermott, and maybe even Seth Johnson, maybe they're making their case for being starting pitchers in this rotation in a fill-in basis later on this season, or certainly to start the 2025 season. Yeah, I think you feel pretty confident with uh, Povich and McDermott, I'll start with. But yeah. you feel pretty confident if there is an injury to you know somebody else in this rotation, uh, they could be the next guys up and, and do a, a pretty good job. Um, I like what Povich has added about eight pounds this offseason, has added a, a mile per hour uh, to, his, to his fastball and bullpens. He's up to like 95 or so, uh, which is a you know lively fastball. Great off speed. Uh, McDermott is another lively fastball. Um, I, I do. Th I mean, they're not going to make the open day roster probably right. uh, unless there's an injury. But I, I do think they they project as starters long term. Maybe McDermott. And I don't ever want to you know shrink a guy's potential. I think he can be a starter. But I, I do I do wonder just with the life on his pitches um, if if McDermott would be a very an impact reliever. Um, you know you know big big spot reliever. Yeah. Uh, great strikeout. Kind of like a, you know, like great strikeout rates. Uh, so I do kind of wonder, like, maybe that's the way he goes. But we've seen it with D.L. Hall, too. You know, who's he's doing really well with Milwaukee right now after the trade, uh, where, you know, I think a lot of people in, in, you know, in Baltimore thought maybe reliever for D.L. Hall, but he could be a starter in both in, in, in Milwaukee. And, and he's looked good early on as, yeah. a, as a rotation guy. Um, Seth Johnson. Uh, one of the nicest guys around played guitar in the talent show yesterday. Uh, <laughs> everyone else did ridiculous skits. Grayson Rodriguez stole the tires off of uh, Tyler Wells's car, and here's Seth Johnson playing guitar. <laughs> it was the, like just phenomenal. <laughs> just what phenomenal. a contrast! I know it's like 
everyone else is just doing shenanigans and then there's that johnson just like pouring his soul out on a anyway here's wonder bright eyes yeah. yeah anyway here's wonderwall yeah uh but you know it is uh you know i wonder if anyone yelled him to play Freebird. that would have been great <laughs> uh but uh yeah but actually his pitching ability has looked really good <laughs> and um we we saw him against the atlanta braves you you have pitched two innings against the atlanta braves earlier this uh this spring training and that was their a lineup like he he played a, um who was in there azuna olsen um i think acuna was in there uh ozzy albies like uh, big big people on their on the rock in the road in their um lineup yeah were in that on that roster and he did great you know he got away with a fastball to matt olsen that flew out to the wall but he had some swing and miss with the slider um his fastball set johnson's fastball does look good um you know 94 to 96 about um you, there's a lot to like about Seth Johnson. He's just a little bit behind just from the fact that he had Tommy John surgery. Last year was a recovery year. Uh, so this is kind of the first time he's really pitching um, during spring training uh, at a major league camp and probably starts the season in AAA. Uh, reached AA last year. Um, so maybe AA for like two starts and then up to AAA. But, you know, um, I, I think he's mostly a triple-A guy, but I do really like what Seth Johnson projects for the future uh, from my small sample sizes. Seeing him uh, has looked really good. Yeah. So off day today for the Orioles. Uh, then they face the Tigers for another night game tomorrow. They've got the Braves on Saturday. They've got a split squad game against the Blue Jays on Sunday. Uh, but are you looking for anything in particular over this next week? I know Brandon Hyde doesn't give you too much of a heads up about who's going to be pitching and and who you'll see in the near term. But what are you looking forward to in maybe the next week or so of games while we also have a week from today, that spring breakout Orioles prospects uh, game on the 14th? That's something to look forward to as well. But anything uh, down in Sarasota that you're looking forward to in this next week, Andy? I'm getting out of here. I'm on a plane to <laughs> I'm on a plane to Southern California to go see my partner. So I'm good. Good. Uh, I'm not really looking forward to too many things in Sarasota. Um, Handing the baton back to Danielle <laughs> Allen Tuck. Yeah, Danielle's taking over for the next week, and I'll be back after that. But uh, yeah, I think the interesting thing would be the spring breakout a week from today. Uh, yeah. I think a seven o'clock game on MLB Network um, could be Paul Skeens in the mound for the Pirates. Uh, we've already seen him on the mound for one inning, uh, a ground out from Jackson Holiday in that at bat. Jackson will always want revenge. He's that kind of guy. He thinks he can do better next time and, uh, you know, buckle in. Uh, that could be a, a long, you know, this is the second at bat against, you know, between the two of them. And it could be a long future of those two facing off, obviously, uh, NL versus AL. So they won't see each other that frequently, but, you know, maybe in all star games and things like that. Maybe we're bringing back the Pirates Orioles rivalry that dominated maybe. the '70s. You know, maybe, maybe that's coming back at some point. Uh, Andy, thanks so much for for joining us, and uh, hopefully you get some rest in the next week before you have to uh, settle in for the final couple of weeks of spring training and then head back up to Baltimore. It's it's a grind spring training. I think few people, a lot of people, just say see the warm weather and the palm trees and think you're just kicking your feet up, but it's a grind. Yeah, I haven't seen the I haven't seen the Gulf of Mexico yet. I'm like five yeah. miles from it. I'm like, what? I haven't seen it. So go do uh, that. Put down I have the played, paddle. I have played a lot of pickleball, so <laughs> that is. Uh, I think my game is getting pretty good. There we um, go. Paul Paul was a great partner, just for listeners who now Thank don't. You. They've it's... hopefully logged off by now. You, but yeah, um, <laughs> you you yeah. flatter me as well. Yeah. It was a good uh, partner. <laughs> Be sure to uh, keep on the lookout for everything that Andy is writing on the baltimorebanner.com where you can subscribe $1 for six months and follow him on Twitter at AF Casca. You can follow me at Paul Mancano and at All Banner Sports. And of course, Danielle Allen Tuck will be back very soon down in Sarasota. Kyle Goon is writing some great stuff as well as John Mioli. Have you covered for the final three weeks of spring training? Thanks so much for tuning in. On Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever you tuned in, we'll have another show for you next week on the Banner Baseball Show.